And welcome to Backyard Cigars. Some time ago, a friend of mine asked me, where did cigar bands come from? How did they come to be? How did they develop? And why is it that no one can give me an answer on that? So I said to him, well, I will do some digging and I'll see what I come up with. I did a lot of research, but the most definitive uh, document that I came across was The Truth About Havana Cigars by Gustavo Bach. Now, Gustavo Bach was involved in the cigar industry during the heyday of the Cuban empire, Cuban tobacco empire. I forget exactly what brand it was. He did purchase a brand. I don't know if he was involved with either Henry Clay or H. Upman, but he was an investor of sorts and he was involved in the importation and and uh, uh, assisted with uh, exportation as well in Cuba. Now, for more information on this topic, I'm always going to say that so the most famous cigar historian, Tony Hyman, is probably the man to talk to. Now, Tony Hyman is the creme de la creme when it comes to cigar historians. And pretty much uh, looking at some of his research verified that what I was looking at and what I was coming across was indeed accurate. Tony Hyman has a cigar museum. He's a wonderful gentleman. I've never met him. But from what I've seen from him and his passion for cigars, he's just the type of person that I would love to meet, sit down and smoke a couple of cigars with, and just have a great time talking about cigars and everything cigar related. Because he's a walking encyclopedia. And I know sometimes that that, description is used for many people, but in Mr. Hyman's case, he is indeed the real deal. Check him out online and uh, just uh, take a look at his page, TonyHyman.com, I believe, unless I'm incorrect about that, I will post it in the notes. So let's take a look about The Truth About Havana Cigars by Gustavo Bach, published by the Havana Tobacco Company, on 111 Fifth Avenue, New York, and this is copyright 1904. And we have here the reason why cigar bands are used. Millions of domestic cigars made in duplicate shapes and to closely resemble the genuine imported Havana cigars of our standard brands are supplied at low cost to retail cigar dealers in all parts of this country by unscrupulous manufacturers to be used for stuffing or filling up boxes that originally contained genuine imported cigars and many dishonest dealers buy empty imported boxes and refill them with these imitation domestic substitutes. Imitations of all our standard brands are also made in Havana. This is why it is necessary for us at a cost of nearly a quarter of a million dollars a year to band our brands of cigars to protect you from this criminal fraud. Now, our brands of Havana cigars include every variety known to and demanded by the varying taste of the most intelligent and exacting cigar smokers in the world. The mild and delicate blends made of the finest and lightest leaf, the full flavored blends made of the heavier leaf that yields the most body and aroma, and also all the intermediate grades from mildest to strongest. Moral, either you buy your imported cigars of honest dealers or else examine carefully the boxes and bands of the cigars shown you. If you wish to avoid being imposed upon and swindled by the spurious domestic made substitutes that are commonly offered and sold as genuine Havana cigars. If you're buying imported Havana cigars of a dealer whom you do not know, ask him to show you a box that has not been opened. Then you will be reasonably sure 
of getting the genuine goods. Now, on July 19th, 1904, Gustavo Bach wrote this, and it was included in the book, having, during a residence on this island of 46 years, devoted all my time to discovering, to the minutest detail, the best method for the production of the highest quality of Havana cigars, I respectfully submit the following pages to all intelligent smokers of good cigars placing before them the convictions of one who has had, perhaps, greater opportunities owing to longer experience than any other manufacturer of cigars, in full confidence that my opinions will meet with unchallenged acceptance. The statements I have made are incontestable and can be verified, and I have therefore the right to ask that they be taken as facts. If what I have just said be understood and accepted. No further argument is necessary to demonstrate that the cigars manufactured under my personal direction in the 23 factories controlled by the Havana Tobacco Company cannot be equaled in character, in quality, or in workmanship by any other cigars in the world. Very faithfully yours, Gustavo Bach. Now, it is believed that Gustavo Bach was putting bans on the Cuban cigars as early as 1867. But there are some reports that they saw it done in the 1830s, where it was just sort of a piece of brown paper placed around the cigar with a code on it. Nothing sophisticated, nothing fancy, definitely nothing to look at, and something mostly that uh, smokers would just throw away the minute they got their cigar. It wasn't glued on. But as times went by, well, we all know about how often Cuban cigars are counterfeited. As time went by, they started to lose a lot of money to counterfeits. So they needed to do something, even if it cost them a lot of money to do it. Little did they know where it would lead to. Little did they know that it would become about something more than just authenticating a cigar. It would nearly be almost identical as the true identity of the cigar in some respects. Because we look at a cigar and we look at the band and it speaks to us. Of course, you're not supposed to judge a book by its cover or a cigar by its band. Not at all. As a matter of fact... I tend to look past that. I look at the brand's reputation, the quality of the tobaccos that are used. The appearance of the cigar matters as well. How well constructed it seems. The feel of it in your hand, of course. All of these things matter. But the cigar ban is the first thing that catches our eye. The first thing that we, well, that pops up at us. And it can become the identity of a cigar. For certain cigars especially. Not necessarily for every single cigar, but you get the idea. So what we're looking at now here is what does cabinet selection mean? This is something that I uh, pulled off a website called Cig Cigars LTD. UK Cigar Library. So this is from a, a library in the UK. and uh, but, but before we got full on Nefertiti or anything like that with holograms, there were stages. This is a cabinet selection, La Flor Dominicana. And this is a cigar by Warped Cigars. Yeah, I forget the name of it. I think it's El Lirio. Yes, Lirio Rojo, or Roja, I believe it is, which translates to Red Lily. And Warped Cigars released these cigars in 50 count cabinets. Nicaraguan Puro, I believe. The LFD is uh, 
Dominican tobacco in this cabinet selection. And it basically, you buy these cabinets in 50s just like this. No band. This is um, a cabinet of 10 cigars, but this isn't obviously your traditional cabinet, but employs some of the same uh, uh, effectiveness that these cabinets made. Well, it, it originates from that. Now, these cigars are ob ob obviously not cabinet style. They have bands on them. The cabinet itself isn't particularly special. It's, it's decent. I don't believe it is cedar. I'd be surprised if it is, but if it is, that would be great. It's a small cabinet of 10 cigars, but you don't call it a cabinet. They aren't going with that. That, that's not the, the, the traditional way. They're just employing this style, right? So these cabinets were, were made and these, these boxes with the cigars inside of them would go in their spot into this ornate uh, cabinet that was being built. These were the little uh, sliding boxes that came in and out of it and they could be small or they could be huge it all depend on how much money you had to spend needless to say anyone who could afford such an item would insist on the highest quality for all its contents thus it became common practice for only the best rollers from each factory using the finest selection of tobaccos to be permitted to roll the cigars for cabinets hence Cabinet selection. Today, the cabinets themselves are a thing of the past. Although old ones can be bought empty at Christie's at prices in excess of their original value when full, but the boxes containing either 50 or 25 first-rate cigars live on. Significantly, the Cuban industry refers to them as SLBs, which stands for Slide Lid Box, a testimony to their English origins. And this was reproduced with kind permission of Hunters and Franco, December 2000, Havana's, Havana cigar importers with over 200 years experience. Now, La Flor Dominicana's nod to the cabinet style is obviously just that. They're paying homage to that tradition, that Cuban tradition of the cabinet selection. Now, this here, what I have here is an article from Drug Topics magazine, and this is from January 15th, 1910. And in it, there's a small article, or actually a small excerpt, uh, Origin of Cigar Bands. I asked a local dealer what tobacco company it was that first originated the idea of using bands on cigars for advertising purposes, says Observer in the Boston Post. The dealer laughed at my ignorance. Cigar bands, said he, were not originally used for advertising. Long ago, when it was common for Cuban and Spanish maidens to smoke cigars, just as they now smoke cigarettes, the manufacturers of the smaller cigars started placing bands of manila paper around their products for the ladies' benefit. These bands the women removed and placed on their little fingers so that they could flick the ash of the cigar without soiling or burning themselves. It was many years before the dealers thought of placing rings of gaudily colored paper in the place of these sober and purely utilitarian bands, but as soon as one was bright enough to do it, all the others immediately followed suit. But there are very few persons who know how the bands originated. And so this story kind of, uh, it, it, it takes its basis off of uh, stories within the royal family in uh, England, in Britain, where the ladies were just so darn proper that um, that that they had to do these type of things. I couldn't disprove that this actually happened, but I could disprove that it wasn't the origin of bands as we know them. 
And and I don't think that they were anything that was done on a mass level, perhaps for these women of uh of of royalty there was such a service okay so before i bore you with some more reading let's take a look at some cigars here here we have a cuban bolivar right very classical band i would say you have the man himself on it and it looks very well gilded then we have a more classic Paltagas. And it's just a red and gold band. It's pretty simple, right? Very old traditions. You get here. And you're looking at this Ramon Ayones. This is also very typical of the style of cigar band that you would find in Cuba. In the early days, perhaps there was less emphasis on the quality of the the paper used, the stock involved, and some of the graphic details, perhaps. I think those are fair assumptions. So we move on to... What really set everything off, right? That band that we look at and we see the hologram and we see all all other kinds of hidden authentication uh, um, traps, if you might call them that, for those that are trying to counterfeit a cigar like this. And while people might say, well, they could steal the bands and put them on fake cigars, well, guess what? I if, if I'm correct, and I'm not an expert at Cuban cigars, but if I'm correct, the bands are guarded more closely than the tobacco. So you if, if, if you got yourself a hold of some bands that were legit, then you're sitting on a gold mine, right? Because that's what people are counting on to authenticate the cigars. But no, instead they resort to copying this in, in, in its imperfection and, and fool a lot of people most of the time. Um, because it's such a widespread cigar and people so desperately want to try it, they feel they need to take that risk. Well, in this type of band, there is uh, there are different ways to tell besides the holograms. Uh, just certain patterns that have to be followed on the cigar, the way that the dots line up, that they're not cut off in any way, sort of like with Louis Vuitton bags, right, where the lettering has to uh, remain in a certain consistent way. But there are, obviously, m there's more to this cigar wrapper than what I'm revealing in this moment. I'm Cigar band that I'm revealing in this moment. But you get the idea that this, this was the culmination of, you know what, years of, I'm tired of being copied. I'm tired of being sold as an inferior product when I'm not. And uh, it hurt. They felt it was definitely hurting the brand of all of their Cuban cigars. So they had to do it. Now, we're looking here at a vintage cigar from, I believe, the 1940s or 1930s. And this is a White Owl cigar. I believe it's from the 1930s, 30, either 39 or 49, 1949. And this is a very simple band. No, uh, uh, this, this, this cigar does have Cuban tobacco in it. Um, I, I believe it. this is one of the last that White Owl made that were handmade. Um, but I could be wrong about that as well. I believe they may have made uh, some handmade cigars long after that. But uh, obviously, we know what happened with, with White Owl and the direction that they took later in, uh, in the company's history. But nonetheless, at this moment in time, uh, when this cigar was released, it was, it was the shit. It was the shit. So now we look at uh, a Cuban cigar 
from, well, recently purchased a year ago, right? And you see now secondary band, a uh, lot of good stock of the paper here. I'm just bringing it up so you can see. Come on. This is the Hoya de Monterrey. Procure number two. I wish I could get it to look clearer, but you get the idea here. There you go. See that? You see how they did the detail on it? It's it represents so much of their history, right? So much of the the legacy of these Cuban cigars and how they are identified visually as well as they are authenticated and that is why so much emphasis is put on 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 the bands not just being pretty and you know easy to look at and in some cases very traditional but of a certain stock certain quality something to set them apart and that's that's uh, that's where the cuban government went but it it affected everybody in 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 uh in the cigar world Okay, so this article is the Tobacco Leaf uh, column, and this is from April 15th, 1908. Okay, and here we have Furon Cigar Bander, a compact, efficient, and economical device for cigar manufacturers. The custom of banding cigars has been a great disadvantage to the cigar manufacturer. It has materially increased his cost of doing business because the work has always been done by hand and hand work is slow, irregular, and demands an inordinate amount of floor space. For a long time, cigar manufacturers have looked for a mechanical device that would handle this work satisfactorily. Satisfactorily, yes. At last, James J. Furon of Philadelphia has patented a machine which purposes to reduce the cost, time, and labor of banding cigars down to the very lowest terms. Mr. Firon is known both as an inventor and as the, an authority on mechan mechanics and is often called into local courts as an expert witness. He became interested in this subject through his brother, Thomas Firon, a practical cigar manufacturer who has been working for years to obtain such a machine. The practical knowledge of Thomas E. Fearon as to the requirements of the cigar manufacturers supplementing the mechanical ability of James J. Fearon made a combination likely to meet the practical requirements of the trade. So, uh, basically... Hey, he came up with a machine that was going to reduce costs and labor for banding cigars. That really helped because at this point, they knew that it was uh, uh, necessary to ban the cigars, but it was costing them and they needed to find ways to do that. And with these type of inventions, it put the manufacturing of the cigars and the way that they were going to be marketed and advertised in a much uh, uh Cheaper way it was done in a cheaper way, basically. And here you have a um, photo of the machine, as you can see, the Fearon cigar banding machine. Doesn't look like much, but to a cigar manufacturer in uh, 1908, this meant an increase in the bottom line. Here. Also, 1908, a man by the name of Frederick Cruz. An altogether new pattern and style of cigar band has been brought out by Frederick Cruz of 124 Hudson Street in Hoboken, New Jersey. According to the drawings shown, the Cruz style consists of a double band connected by a strip running along the cigar which must be torn off to remove the bands. The bands cannot, therefore, be taken off and placed on another piece of good, thereby preserving substitution. The inventor believes 
that a further and much wider field of utility can be reached by this device by using it as a government stamp for each individual cigar. Yet the adoption of this method would revolutionize the whole of the present internal revenue system as regards cigars and if adopted lead to a big saving in the cost of cigar boxes which under this method would not require to be destroyed as at present members of the trade interested in this new idea can get further particulars from mr cruz at the address noted up to the end of this month and from may 1st will be found at 319 fifth street Union Hill, New Jersey. Okay, News of the World style here. Still 1908. How to tell a bad cigar. Okay. This article was written. Okay. As a preliminary canter, to use a term borrowed from the racing stable, examine the box. The first thing that the Experienced smoker does is to examine the box. If the box is highly ornamented, he is sure of his cigar. No manufacturer would think it worth his while to place poor tobacco in an expensive box. Again, if the box be simply stamped with the name of the brand without any glitter of gold or tawdry chromatic effects, it is clear that the vendor is so confident of the excellence of his products that he need not rely on any catchpenny devices. Having satisfied himself on this point, you turn to the picture on the inside of the lid. If it represents a great man, say Napoleon, Hall Kane, Professor Munyon, Mr. Pickwick, you're perfectly safe. If their names are not a sufficient guarantee, well, what do you want? Many cigar smokers prefer pictures of the early Victorian prima donnas. That is merely a matter of taste. You cannot convince an habitual smoker of four penny Donna Binos that he would get a better smoke out of a six penny Sims. He has his opinion. You have yours. His is wrong. But let him keep it. There are two sides to every question. The wrong side and your side. Next. You look at the garter on the cigar itself. It does not, of course, as every expert knows, actually affect the quality of the wrapper, provided it is stuck together with good gum. But a garter of some sort you must have. The garter is to a cigar what a tiara is to a woman. This is a beautiful and a brainy thought. You see, if you have paid four pence or even six pence for your weed, you want the public to know as you walk along the street that you have invested this amount of capital on your smoke. This is not ostentatious. This is not ostentation. It is philanthropy, quite a different thing. It is pleasant for other people to feel that they are in the presence of wealth, judiciously expended. Besides, suppose you happen to be offered a naked cigar by a friend, you need not refuse it. You have preserved the old garter of your Oscar Y. Ulysses, and you can put it on the penny pickwick presented by your psychophantic admirer. And B, do not stick it on with ordinary glue. Tobacco is very sensitive to external conditions and is instantly influenced by mucilage. Stamp paper is much better. In order to give the cigar a chance, you should go in to any of the best jewelers on Bond Street and buy an amber about two feet long. If you purpose smoking really good cigars, select a holder with some neat device and diamonds. <laughs> so they were calling cigar bands garters at this point in time. And obviously, we're missing the point of just enjoying a good cigar and instead preaching about the presentation of, well, everything other than the quality of the tobacco. And when they mentioned the quality of the tobacco, <laughs> the reasons for justifying it as good quality were perhaps 
uh, back in his day, back in these days, was more, uh, you could be a little bit more trustworthy. But I reckon that there was just as much, uh, uh, you know, shenanigans going on in 1908 with uh, fraudulent uh, practice that we can easily say that if you were a man judging the cigar by the box it comes in and the particular uh, uh, face that's in it, if you believe that today, you'd obviously be getting ripped off a lot because we know better than that. But at that point in time, uh, he was kind of right that a lot of people wouldn't take the time to put uh, cheap cigars in an expensive box. It just wasn't as profitable as it is now. But I don't put it past anybody trying it back then either so um yeah very funny that they called it garters in 1908 okay time to look at some more cigars you know arturo fuente had a similar problem with um counterfeiting of his cigars and being sold off lower quality cigars being sold uh as opus x and he had to come up with his own uh, plan to stop it. They, of course, have one of the most iconic bands in the cigar world today. And this one in particular has a cedar sleeve with a satin red footband along with, well, you guys are familiar with that, right? I think... It needs no introduction. Ernesto Perez Carillo, aside from winning Cigar of the Year whenever Padron is not, is uh, really into its uh, the, the quality of, of its bands. And I just think they're beautiful year after year. And I don't think it hurts them at all when deciding about choosing one of their cigars over another cigar it just looks so pleasing to the eye and in and they're beautiful they just are now that's what you're getting in the modern classic sense right with that type of style but cao uh came up with this idea in the 2000s i forget 2013, I think. And uh, it's just a piece of tobacco rope, right? It's just a, you know, rolled up tobacco here. And I thought this this was very distinct. I, th I thought that this stood out in a way that, well, that no cigar had stood out up until that point. We can't forget that small boutique companies also contributed to the rise of funky rappers and 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 all kinds of uh, different ideas for what a band could be, and not actually being a band at all, but still a band if you get what I mean. So this is Ezra Zion Nomad, and this is uh, I believe the Knife Fighter, and as you can see, you've got just a piece of nylon across it holding this looks like a Rambo knife but isn't and uh and that's and that's pretty distinct right um then then you've got where they do this where they kind of just you know nylon rope over the cigar as a band and, uh, and other cigar manufacturers and cigar companies have actually done this as well so I don't I'm not saying that they were the first but these guys were definitely the first, as far as I know. We can't forget about Viaje, right? I mean, Viaje with their Hulk series and their superheroes. But before we look at Viaje, uh, a classic example how a cigar's identity is, uh, the, the band is part of the cigar's identity, is this in this Laranja. Um, this, I believe, is by Espinosa. Uh, it, it's, a, it's a cigar that the cigar wrapper is actually uh, considered to be an orange wrapper, right? So they call it naranja because 
you know, that translates to orange uh, from Spanish to English. And, and, and it has that hue, has that hue, like an orange hue. And it's Brazilian naranja is what they call it. And uh, it's something that they found and have procured. And uh, so to go along with that color, you've got, right, you've got this, this band. Pretty nice band, if I say so myself. But when we start talking about viaje, I mean, <laughs> you're going to put these zombie antidotes into a plastic or I don't know if it's a metal uh, glass jar as seeming uh, injections uh, to cure you of the zombie, zombie uh, virus and uh, with instructions intact and, uh, and everything else. That is just so cool, right? That is very cool. Um, this one in particular, the jalapeno. I mean, look, at the end of the day, uh, a lot of things are gimmicks, right? But but if they work, they work. And and if the gimmick is uh, associated with a good quality cigar, then they stand to, they stand to gain the companies. So they get your attention with these type of things, and uh, and and it becomes a part of how we purchase cigars as consumers, right? We look at them. So you know we read the specs, right? But at the end of the day, this, 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 and this isn't me per se, but we all know this is an Instagram worthy picture type of, you know, for cigar, for a cigar page. It is different. Um, they've done the ones where it's, it's like a piece of dynamite or something like that. And you've got a fuse. I mean, this is, uh, I think a honey hand grenade or, and, and, and you can see this red, foil towards the bottom of this Maduro Lancero, also very different. Now, this article is from uh, the National Lithographer, volume 23, 1916. Why the cigar band? An impatient smoker of cigars wrote to the editor of the New York Evening Sun complaining that cigar bands are a nuisance. Tear the wrappers and inspire profanity. The William Steiner and Sons Company, who lithograph millions of these wrappers, thereupon rise to explain and do it to the smoker's taste. In the first place, they say, that as all the alleged facts stated are incorrect, and as publicity of such incorrect statements tends to injure an industry employing a large number of men at good wages at which contributes indirectly to many other industries through their purchases. We desire to call, to call same to your attention. In the first place, an advance in the price of cigars or reduction of the size would probably be forced upon the cigar manufacturer owing to the fact that tobacco, labor, boxes, chemicals, labels, and bands have all advanced materially. It is not true that the reason for the advance would be because of labels and bans having previously been made in Germany, as only about to 1% of the entire quantity of this material used in this country was ever imported from Germany. The price of the German article has always been considerably higher than that of the American production, and we must admit the German quality was better. We must further take issue with you as regards the futility of banding and labeling cigars. This is not done for the purpose of making the package look gaudy. Cigars, as well as any other article of individuality, are banded and labeled for identification. And the goodwill of it well-established quality brands runs into large figures. That the manufacturer is not protected without his banding the cigar is well exemplified by an incident lately brought to our knowledge. The manufacturers of a well-known cigar recently started to brand to ban their product at an annual cost to them of about $100,000. Since the cigar has been banded, its sales have increased about 50 million cigars a year. 
The makers attribute the increased sales not to the fact that more of their the cigars are asked for, but to the fact that prior to having banded them, many unscrupulous dealers would refill the boxes with cigars, which cost less money. Not alone depriving the manufacturer of deserved sales, but also damaging the reputation of their cigar. As naturally enough, the substitute would be would not be as good as the original. As manufacturers of the bands used on these cigars, we know that some small dealers in Philadelphia are offering as high as 10, 40 cents a thousand for bands of this band of this brand which have been removed from cigars without breaking. As the bands carry no premium value, the fact that there is a price on the same shows in itself that boxes have been restuffed and that the manufacturer is protecting himself by banding. As a matter of fact, some of the large manufacturers who have started to ban their cigars within the past year are advertising that their cigars are now banded for identification and protection of the public. I feel that the publishing of a statement like this in The Sun damages an industry consisting to my personal knowledge, of eight large firms employing probably between 2,000 and 3,000 men and purchasing paper and other supplies to the amount of several million dollars annually. We're going to take a little look at some other things that have occurred over the years in regards to bands and their identity, the cigar's reputation, or just getting the new consumer to try something because it looks well, more in tune with what they consider to be, uh, well, trendy, right? So, Romeo y Julieta, the uh, Dominican in Dominican brand that uh, and Nicaraguan as well, came up with this idea, which a lot of people like. And look, I'm not gonna hate on it. It's got it's 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 eye catchy. It's definitely eye-catching. And you look at it, and it's got the gold, and it's just, oh, man, you know, it's shiny. It isn't traditional in any way. It was something of an idea to attract, uh, you know, a younger crowd. And uh, to reinvigorate interest in the, brand, in the brand, in that it was keeping up with the times. It wasn't going to just stick to the traditional bands, which they still use on many of their cigars, but this one is different. And it's damn tasty too. Okay, this one is another example of, this is a Rocky Patel cigar, how some cigars are, the, the band isn't here. The band is a foot band. And it's and it's here and, and you're basically going to have to take it off. In some cases, if it's loose, um, myself included, sometimes I've slid it up or if it comes off easily here, it's probably better to just take it off there. And if you can fit it back up top, then do so. If you want to go through that, you know, if you do, I'm not saying I haven't done it, but with something like this, I would probably just remove it. But if it was like something really beautiful, then maybe, I guess, I don't know. Okay, I promise you this is the last article. The Spokesman Review, Spokane, Washington. Spokane? Spokane? Okay. And it is about cigar bands. This particular uh, article occurred on uh, the morning of December the 2nd, 1916. And is the cigar band really worthwhile? Why the cigar band? The New York Sun made this a subject for debate by declaring editorially that Paper bands on cigars are a nuisance. They tear the wrappers and they inspire profanity. In a more enlightened day, the good cigar will be known by the Gaudi belt. It does not wear. There's the makers of cigars took the field and complained. Bands, they said, are necessary labels. They give cigars distinctiveness. And, above all, they foil the low dealer who substitutes 
quant qualities of El Fume for higher priced favorites, varieties. The lesser seems to be between the moral welfare of the smoker and the flaccid or fiscal well-being of the manufacturers. There is no doubt that the utility of the cigar ban becomes questionable about the time people stop saying them to paste as to paste in asymmetrical fashion on pin trays and plaques. This school of art has a notable vogue and indeed still linger in remote districts, but it really lost its hold upon the hearts of the people at the same time as sofa pillow made orange yellow cigar ribbons were made during what might be called the nicotine period of the American Artiac effort, I guess. <laughs> I'm sorry, guys. It's very small lettering, uh, very weirdly written for the time. But um, basically, he says, in fact, he was strongly impelled, compelled to buy cigars for the decorativeness of their bands rather than for the excellence of their tobacco. Many appealing instances of of self-sacrifice were recorded at this time. Bands were also at one time used because they were redeemable for prizes, but that phase passed with the advent of the coupon. Unless the manufacturers can find some new way to arouse public intent or interest in the cigar ban, they may have to do away with it altogether. If they do abolish the paper strip, the world will at last be freed from the annoying spectacles of the man who neglects to remove the band from his cigar until his paper begins to burn. <laughs> point taken, point taken, sir, point taken. I understand that. I understand that, but do away with them. They did not. And here we have uh, more examples of where they did not do away with them. <laughs> this is Ezra Zion. And I believe this is Melted Ice Grim. And you see that? It's a whole sleeve. It has to come off. Then you have a naked cigar, right? Like this. This is from SJ Cigars in Philadelphia. I think it's a really regal looking band. You know, Crown Vintage. It's even got like, right, Crown Vintage. It's a nice band. But when we talk about beautiful bands, right? Look, this is this is this is San Cristobal, and that's just beautiful. That's just wow. I love parrots. Um, in the case of some Macanudos uh, vintage, this 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 actually is the band which can serve as a uh, cigar holder as well. It's pretty heavy. This is another Ezra Zion Nomad, and it was at the foot of the cigar as well. But this one in particular, I can admit that I liked so much that I uh, slipped it off and slipped and, and slipped it back on and, and kept it on the cigar. I just really liked the uh, looking at the Green Army Men. Brought me back to my childhood. And, uh, you know, they keep coming up because they have pretty funky stuff, right? Ezra Zion Nomad. Kettle corn, <laughs> right? Kettle corn. Did it taste like popcorn? No, it did not. But it did have some flavor notes that one could associate with it. Okay, here we have Ernesto Perez Carillo. If I'm correct. Is this Ernesto Perez? Yeah, this is a uh, prestige. Am I, am I right here? Call me out on this one, guys. I don't think it's Ernesto Perez Carillo. But it, but it is. But it is. Because it's the pledge. And it's beautiful. It's really nice. 
This is really nice. It's just really nice. Let me check that out, right? Look at that. Look at that. <sighs> Sweet. Um, of course, we're going to look at the Cohiba, right? This is now off. We can see the hologram effect in the back. And th who knows? There's just so much that the experts can gather from one of these bands. So much. Um, this is, of course, the Ashton. We believe this is the VSG. And they have beautiful bands as well. I mean... <laughs> Just amazing. This is another one from SJ Cigars that I just liked. It was on a Triple Lijero Dominican Puro, I believe it was. And I just thought it was pretty cool, too. It was a really nice one. Uh, Rocky Patel with the uh, rare uh, limited edition cigars has done pretty good. And there was more to the cigar than just this. But this was all I actually salvaged. But it was very, very well presented, and it was very nice looking. Um, as you, as I read in that last statement, that there was a time when these cigar bands had value beyond the uh, smoking of a cigar, because once uh, you know you took the band off, uh, you could use it as a coupon of sorts. So kids collected them, adults collected them, and gained points, and and in were able to get things or, or get discounts on things with a certain amount of these uh, cigar bands, depending on the cigar or the band. So cigar bands have definitely come a long way. Um, I would love to go through a few more bands if you guys want. This one was by Asylum, Devil's Night. Um, this is in a... This is a... Gran Reselva, Arturo Fuente Gran Reselva. H this is uh, just something that I remember from a very good cigar. HR, Hiroshi Robaina. This is one of the last uh, Nat Sherman cigars that I smoked. Uh, this is uh, another cigar band from SJ Cigars. So really nice looking. This one came off of one of La Aurora's 115th anniversary. And also had a lot of hologram effects. Uh, this is the Melanic from Foundation Cigars. And uh, I thought that was distinctive. Uh, La Flor Dominicana can either go very simple, very traditional, or sometimes they'll do something like this that looks like a huge Wonder Woman cuff. But um, And then you have the traditional Cuban styles, right? Um, like Punch. And uh, here's another little piece of... Uh, it's probably a secondary one. This is from the cigar that we had here. Where is it? Uh, San Cristobal. Uh, this is an example of a Viaje, Incredible Hulk. Uh, this is a Dominican brand uh, run by a woman who worked for Arturo Fuente at one point, and uh, she incorporates flowers into her bands. Really nice. Um, this is El Americano, uh, American Puro by J.C. Newman. And uh, it's also really nice. I, do I like that? Yeah, I do like that it has that flag on it. <laughs> um, Ali Selassie. This is another foundation cigar. Well, guys, look, you've spent, if, if you've been watching, you've spent some time with me. I just, I, this, it was, um, it was an honor to just share some of the information that I've gathered and to answer the question of where cigar bands originated and just a little bit at their history in the course of time up until the point where we're at with very trendy cigar uh, stuff going on and all kinds of ideas being thrown into the mix and still not forgetting the traditions of cigars that look like this and still honoring the traditions of the cabinet selection. Now, I haven't smoked this cigar yet, so when I do, my review is going to rely heavily on whether it meets that standard for the cabinet selection or 
Was it just a name? We shall see. Listen, folks, I want to thank you all for watching Backyard Cigars. Till next time, thank you for watching. Good night, ladies and gentlemen.